Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag. Let's get right into it. This one contains awesomeness, so we're going to crack this one open. It is from Ready Made RC. Ooh, sounds good. Oh, so much crap on this bench. Don't know where to start. Let's get into it. What do we got? We got a note. Don't want to spoil it for myself. Oh, it does look pretty awesome. In terms of boards, oh -ha. James Field, thank you very much, James. Um, and oh, we got some serious power business happening on there. There you go. Look at that. Anyway, what do we got? We've got a portable Android Player 2. Ah, oh, maybe it's not. No, this looks all old stuff. So let's. Yeah, we have a portable Android, a PAP 2. This is like, that feels so crusty. That's got to be one of those, you know, cheap eBay jobbies or something. Um, you know, AliExpress jobs. Um, little Android game player, really? In that sort of Nintendo-y type form factor. And we've got a controller board out of something. Enclosed is a single channel output card from a high-end audio amplifier, uh, typically used to power high, high output loudspeakers in commercial insta installations. Data sheet enclosed. Aha! There is our data sheet. It's a C88 colon 4 for those playing along at home. So this is what we're looking at here, the Lab Gruppen. Uh, <laughs> Gruppen? Never heard of them. C-Series, C88-4. There's the back of the baby. 8800 watts are peak. Okay, peak total power output, yeah. Good old PMPO. Jeez, what are we back in the late 80s, early 90s or something? Anyway, here's the board. And um, James says this is like one of the uh, Rolls-Royce of Pro Audio Amps. Retails for about 5,000 AU. Um, so, yeah, serious bit of good. Um, it was apparently cheaper just to do, just to replace the board than it was to, uh, you know, fix it or whatever. So, yeah, um, it said DC output protection fault. So, eh, who knows? So it's actually not a bad layout board here. Very typical of a uh, stereo amp. You can see the symmetry right down the middle, just flip the thing open and, uh, you know, power down here at all. It's going to all flow quite well. The layout's quite uh, reasonable, I suspect, but it's there's a lot of, you know, you have to get the grounds right, everything else. Um, classic star grounding is, uh, let's have a look here, you know, it's fanning out from the power supply like this, and then that's tapping off there. So, you know, yeah, probably they're doing the business. But anyway, um, for those power transistor fanboys, oh, don't recognize that. And everyone's going, Dave, what are you talking about? They're obviously sanking two SC 3263s. Yeah, okay, obviously. Um, Jelly Bean NPM, well, I'm not going to say Jelly Bean, but, you know, there's nothing special about it. They're like four bucks, one off quantity from DigiKey NPN. Uh, planner, power transistor, meh. Tell you what, I do like how they've bolted those down to that heat sink. That really is quite, uh... That really is quite jazzy. Look at that. I mean, it's got them going vertically like this because you could see that on the photo that we saw before. These go right on the uh, back panel and the airflow comes from inside straight over those. So I would hazard a guess that'd be pretty darn effective. I've gone to the effort to make a little uh, surface mount board there. Presumably that's, you know, a de discrete transistor uh, front end amp, I would uh, presume. And But, of course, everything else is uh, through whole tech. I mean, there's nothing you know, really fabulously modern going on here. Uh, the design could date from, you know, anywhere back to the 80s, really. And, of course, the symmetry in the design there, not for uh, you know, it's two separate uh, channels, but it's going to be uh, both the positive and negative side. Because if you look at um, any typical schematic for a uh, power amplifier, they're going to be um, uh, contain, like it's basically a totem pole output. So there's going to be transistors. If we flip it over, there'll be, there you go. We've got ourselves, they'll be matched uh, N channel and P channel, um, or NPN, PNP, uh, depending on whether in MOSFET or bipolar, um, and symmetry in the design like that. So, yeah, it's both designed to drive it hard to the negative rail, hard to the positive rail, all about the center ground point. And of course, that will star out 
nicely and all your usual uh, star grounding techniques will be involved in that. So I can't see anything really wrong with that. It's uh, quite well made. It's just, you know, a typical high quality uh, discrete transistor design. Uh, it's but 55 grand AU, the Rolls Royce. I don't know. Just just doesn't smell Rolls Royce, but it's certainly not one hung low. And interestingly, on this side here, we have an NTC thermistor that's doing uh, temperature sensing of that heat sink. But this side over here, has three transistors instead of the two with no thermistor. So, huh? they're only thermally um, checking one of the rails. It's a bit poor. So they don't look uh, particularly like uh, main output tranny worthy. So let's have a peek under here. I've taken off the screws. Ta-da. Whoa, yeah. Looks like power MOSFET time. Oh, yeah. Now we're talking ST Semi uh, 60 NK. 30s. These are super mesh power trennies. Wow, oh, now we're talking beauty. And I can't read the number on these, which are clearly uh, diodes. They're, you know, two-pin uh, power packages. And um, even under the Mantis microscope at the right at the light at the right angle, they're an ST something or other. Anyway, it doesn't matter. What they're doing is they're actually uh, going back here, whoop, through some big chokes on there and they go into the output uh, heatsink here. So these heatsinks aren't actually connected. Well, there it is, right? There's the two, um, there's the diode between uh, the heatsink of the output power transistors and the heatsink over here. So what's that doing? Some sort of big protection. It's a big power tranny. Oh, there's a little sneaky bugger temperature sensor on that heatsink there, the main power transistor heatsink. Neat. It's the PAP2 portable Android player. It's a gaming tablet thingamabob. Interesting. The IC PAP200. It feels really crappy quality. Anyway, it's got Android and I guess some games built in. Yes, it does work. It takes forever to boot though. It's got little clicky buttons which have uh, backlit LEDs behind them. It's kind of, you know, give it to your kid. It probably costs 10 bucks or something. I don't know. Hmm. Well, plays Angry Birds, whatever that is. I don't know. I'm not newfangled freaking games. And it's actually rather neat inside, but a battery of questionable origin and quality just flapping around in the breeze, held down with tape. And we've got an AM Logic. What is that? AM8726 M3. It's not a Cortex M3, it's actually a, a uh, Cortex. And that's actually an ARM Cortex uh, A9. And that's an ARM7 Cortex uh, A9, and it's not particularly powerful, but you know, it's cheap and cheerful system on chip stuff. We've got some memory and we've got the little joystick down here. That looks uh, funky, but that's just a joystick. You might think, ooh, what's that little antenna-y thing? No, it's just the bottom of the uh, joystick. Just um, just cheaply soldered onto the side of the board like that. Yeah, it's not very robust, but kind of sort of built down to a price, does the job. and. Not much else. Basically one big system on chi chip, but that's all you need. Arm um, Cortex A9. And that for all the world looks like a Realtek uh, Wi-Fi module. So that's about all she wrote. Have we got a headphone socket there, USB for the charging, and Bob's your uncle. So I'm not sure how much this was. Um, it seems to, let's see, hard to find info on it. Sort of like discontinued, as you'd expect. These things have a you know six to nine month lifespan uh, if they're lucky, but you know, tens of dollars, maybe, it's like, it's, it's bugger all. I mean, you can get a mobile phone for tens of bucks, can't you? It's crazy what you can get. I mean, it just, it, the, the technology 10 years ago, this would have been insane. But wait, as a bonus, we have the USB charger, five volts, half an amp, made in China. Oh, good. Xiong X caps. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Just, uh, well, at least it's fused, flapping around in the breeze there. But bugger all clearance between primary and secondary. Come on. And that transformer. I mean, seriously, that, you know, where's that wound? Someone's kitchen table? But I've seen worse. Next up, we have one from Bataru Inc. Open it up. Battery, battery life extender, double A batterizers as they're better known. 
Who gives a shit anymore? I mean, like, I I think I've lost all enthusiasm to do another Batterizer video. It's just been debunked bullshit so many times on the forum and everything else. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah, there's the thank you note from Dr. Bob. Like, who gives a shit anymore? This product, it, it's just so demonstrably crap. It's like... Next. All right, we've got ourselves a local jobby from person unknown uh, from uh, Melbourne, Burke Street in Melbourne, posted from Melbourne CBD. So let's check it out. Thank you very much, person anonymous. They may actually reveal themselves inside. Who knows? It's pink. That's a concern right off the bat. Um, original foam, crusty old plug pack, a princess made in Taiwan plug, plug pack. All the best stuff was made in Taiwan. Um, oh, 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 wow. Wow. I haven't seen one of those for a long time. It's a princess PBW121 portable television. <laughs> it's a portable television studio. Oh, wow. That is gold. Hands up if you had one of these babies. The Princess Handy TV. Thank you very much. You can just take it anywhere. Get your fingers under there. Carry it around. Rockin'. And who's William McGregor? Born 21st of October 1928. I assume this came from some estate sale. Watch this. Color-coded dial, pink and then yellow to match the symbols next to it. That is gold. Or pink. Hmm. And yep, that's exactly what you'd expect in find inside this thing. A little tiny CRT, which is really cute. And it, it does the business. It's very typical of a... It's neat and tidy, very typical of a uh, little portable TV of the time. Got our tuner down there, and got a lovely looking yoke there, got our flyback transformer, no touchy of course, um, and just one main chip down the bottom which is an AN515 one in or IN, I don't know. Anyway, that's a Mitsubishi job, and that's just neat and tidy. I kind of like it. And it's a Clinton CRT. I think they went out of business this year, didn't they? Or late last year. Hmm. You know, I'm going to assume that's a date code, 8642. So, yeah, 1986, that would be the vintage that I remember these things. I, I can remember these in the shops and thinking, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Portable TV. Wow. And, of course, this is a black and white CRT. None of that colour rubbish. There's no, you know, usual big uh, focusing uh, coils and all that other gizmo in there and, you know, your triple electron guns and all that fancy-pantsy stuff. No, black and white did the business. VHF and UHF. Unbelievable. Now, will it work? Switch it on. UHF. And let's tune in channel 62, see if we can pick up the video from UHF. Hang on, I forgot the telescopic rod antenna. You bloody ripper! Hey kids, where do you want to go? To Uncle Nutsy's clubhouse. That's right, I'm your Uncle Nutsy. And boy oh boy, are we going to have some big fun today, huh kids? Another local jobby. I won't pretend I haven't opened this because it didn't have mailbag on it. If you're going to send something into the mailbag, actually write mailbag on it somewhere so I don't, um, you know, I thought this is maybe something I ordered on eBay or something like that and it just came in the, came in the post. So sorry to, although I haven't actually opened the item yet, sorry to Cody. Um, just thought I'd send what used to be my old... Curiosity got the better. He tore it down himself. Uh, anyway, there's also a kit something with it. Um, this will not be a two-minute teardown. I love when I get stuff pre-torn down. Look at this. Oh, oh, oh that's crusty as. Okay, I thought it was like, um, it is a Nikon D3000. Oh, 
300S, pre-torn down. Wow, and it sort of looks in pretty crusty uh, condition too. So we'll take a closer look at that. <laughs> and there's the Penta mirror. Beautiful, look at that. That's just gorgeous. That, um, you know, they're, I'd love to know the manufacturing that goes into those. They're pretty darn high quality. And you can see that down there that like, you know, this is like it was a serious and still is a serious camera in its day and being able to uh, uh, deflect the light like that um, with, you know, keeping all the optical properties of it. These things are, are pretty jazzy. I like them. Now, the way a pentaprism works, called a pentaprism because it's got five sides on it, and we've got two windows here, one here and one here, and it basically bends the light 90 degrees like that. And, of course, you could just use a regular mirror, but if you use a mirror, then it flips the image. But a pentamirror doesn't do that. It doesn't flip the image at all. But this is what's called a roof Penta mirror. There's the part number for those playing along at home. A roof penta mirror, like used in uh, digital SLR cameras like this, um, only flips the image laterally. And I'll show you. And I've got a demo of that. We've got Hello Worlds flipped laterally, like that. Look at that. Beautiful. Looks like we've got an Aussie fest today. Bloody ripper. Um, this is from No Worries Turf. Okay, um, it feels weird. I'm not sure what's in here. Um, let's open it up. Anyway, um, from uh, Mordia Lock, a lock in Victoria. What? Um, okay. It is actually turf. That's a first. Um, I've been sent turf to an electronics mailbag. Um, 13 millimeter pro golf turf for those playing along at home. Um, like, like why? Why? Why have I been sent noworriesturf.com.au instant lawn? It's fake lawn. I like real lawn. I've got buffalo myself. Um, and it's bloody everywhere. Unbelievable. What? Somebody who watches just wanted to plug their turf lawn business? Okay. You've got to wonder whether or not they're going to astro turf in the comments. <laughs> Get it? Astro turfing? Next. Thank you very much, Pedro Silva, and hi to all my Portuguese viewers. We don't get many from Portugal, so that's awesome. Um, let's get straight into it. What do we got? The requisite note. But what is... Oh, we've got a, uh, got a $2 scientific calculator. Oh, crusty as. <laughs> a join us brand. <laughs> scientific calculator oh wow well, that's got to be at least worth two bucks it's got to be yep that's a classic ripoff of the casio fx82 one of the variants or the 82 ms i guess it is um and i guess imitation is the sincerest form of flattery is it not anyway i've run the uh famous calculator forensics thing on it and this is the result i get i can't remember the guy's name but uh he came up with this algorithm that uh you can work out which chipset or try and work out which chipsets used in this thing by doing um sine cos tan arc sine cos tan of nine and basically it does a really good result it gets very close to nine, I mean, the ideal result is nine spot on, but it's very, very close. And there's only two others in the database, these unknown Jura brand or something and some other one hung low brand one that uh, gives the same result to more decimal places. Um, you can find out more decimal places, but anyway, um, it, it actually does a reasonable result on that. And yeah, well, you know, the keys feel okay, but I would not trust a no name brand like this. Like you don't know if it's got any bugs in it or whatever, I would stick with the real brands. Um, you know, it, I know it's tempting for a couple of bucks, but yeah, just don't. And we'll do the classic 69 factorial and that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. 
So you've got to wonder why it pays them to clone these things. Let's have a look inside. Oh yeah, there we go. Just, wow. It, it's got to use, look, a real separate PCB. So not as refined as the uh, Casio ones, which use the membrane. Everything's integrated in one. But yeah, I mean, they can churn this out for cheap as chips, but it's not like the genuine Casios are super expensive anyway. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I guess, yeah, volume. People go, oh yeah, it's a... You know, it's got 82 in the number, it's familiar, you know, so they buy it at the $2 store. Meh, I, they kind of do the job. But yeah, I just don't want to use one of these things. It gives me the heebie-jeebies. Where they're getting the chipset from, I mean, somebody had to, you know, did they clone the Casio, reverse engineer the Casio chipset, as in, like, clone the damn thing? I don't I don't think so, Um, because I think if you, I don't have a genuine... Uh, FX82 here to actually MS to actually compare it with but uh, I think it would give you a different calculator forensics result so it's I don't think it's an exact clone so you've got to wonder who actually does this I mean goes to the effort to rip off an already reasonably low-cost uh, calculator and just undercut it severely. I know it's probably volume and everything else, and they've got to be making money from this, but it's not like this is like a uh, ghost product that's come off a ghost run on the same assembly line that manufactures the FX82. Uh, it doesn't... You, you know, it's not built the same. It is like... It is a rip-off of it. It is not a clone. The chipset is different. The calculator forensics result is different to the genuine FX82, so it's not using exact copy of the chip in there. And, yeah, I don't get these things. Anyway, I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And this is a four euro model. Wow, that's pricey. Um, you know, I've seen them in the two dollar shop here in Australia for two bucks. Like that's two dollars Australian. So, what's that? In like a dollar fifty euro or something like that. Um, so yeah, they can be even had cheap and didn't even come with batteries. Complete rip off. Anyway, thanks, Pedro. It's not a mailbag without getting one of these. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Shia? Shia? Something like that. Anyway, I'm um, from Dallas, Texas. Awesome. Let's check it out. Uh, yeah, don't these have a pull tab thing on them? Or am I wrong? I believe you ordinarily can open these boxes. Memory serves me correctly. I've got a requisite note with it. Let's have a look here. What do we got? I've got a dev board. Oh! This looks interesting. I won't show you what it is. I'll just hook it up and try it out. What we've got here is an ECG or electrocardiogram. I love electrocardiograms. And this one's on uh, crowd supply. I'll let Matt uh, take it away. There we go. Um, he's. This is available on uh, crowd supply. I'll link it in down below. But it's a uh, ECG analog front end for makers, hobbyists, and academics to use with their own biomedical device or electrophysiology projects. Fantastic. And that's how we hook it up. And I will hook it up. Um, you can hook it up to a scope. Of course, the uh, scope, uh, your battery here shouldn't be uh, mains earth uh, reference. And if your mains were earth reference the output, that's okay. But just be aware it's the output. And here it is. I rather like the uh, enclosure. I don't know why, like, if it's designed to hook up to a scope, I mean, we've just got pin headers like this for the output. And that one's not labeled as well, or is that the same over here? VREF, out. I think they're duplicated. I think, yep, I think that's the same as that. I'll buzz that out, but it's exactly the same. Okay, so they are labeled. So that's our VREF um, uh, output. So we put our scope actually on VREF, which is a bit unusual, but you can change the reference in here. They've got various links to uh, it changed the reference, and this is going to be completely safe. I have no worries hooking it up. Why? Because you can see inside, we've got our uh, 10K resistor in series there, and I'll hook it up. It only draws, uh, you know, a couple of hundred microamps uh, total, or a milliamp, so I'll just hook it up to, like, a CR2032 coin cell vat battery. The power supply is from 1.8 volts to 5.5, so very wide range. You just run off a coin cell battery, completely safe. You've got uh, the protection resistors in series. Nothing can possibly go wrong. Well, if I release this video, you know I'm not dead.
And there's the main board there. I'll link it in down below where you can get uh, all the information for it. But it's got the uh, castellations there so you can solder it directly on the board as we uh, see here. So that's all right. I do actually like the um, laser cut uh, enclosure, how they've, uh, you know, done that. Oh, and I forgot to show the back. There we go. Look at this. All the information. Unipolar limb leads and, oh, the Wilson Central Terminal Equations. Look at that. Beautiful. Um, so... All, everything you need to know about uh, hooking up ECGs is on the back. That's kind of neat. I like that. Um, yeah, it, you know, it's a reasonable approach to uh, construction and how they've actually put those in the centre of the board and uh, hooked to those and soldered those directly onto the board. So that's they've done the slot for the cutout, uh, the slot cutout for the um, the nuts in there, the locking nuts, even though they didn't really have to do that, because the locking nuts don't add well, a huge amount. I guess you could do them up to go against the PCB, so that kind of, yeah, that kind of works. Although, it's still got the leverage on there like that, so yeah, it's not the most robust thing, but anyway, I would have probably liked to have seen that, like you can get right angle 4mm uh, banana jacks, but I don't know if these are like, um, uh, stand, these are probably um, industry standard for ECG leads, are they? I'm not in the game, but I like them. And sure enough, it draws about 230 odd microamps. Uh, no worries, from a CR2032 coin cell battery. The thing I don't like though is that there's no lead on there to show you that A, the power is connected and it's on, and it would have been nice to see a lead on there, like flash in time with the heartbeat. As well, I mean, you could surely you could do that in analog, take the output waveform, square it up, do whatever, um, and flash a LED. I really would have liked to have seen that. I really think that's a, uh, a nice feature that could be added. And even with nothing connected to the input, we're picking up a whole bunch of 50 hertz uh, crap here. That's probably not surprising. It's going to be picking that up from the mat. And if I take it off there see, and get it closer like that, yep, it just starts to pick up all the... All the garbage. It should be right once we actually get a, um, a, a decent impedance on the input uh, from the body. And sorry for the nudity, I probably don't have a uh, white balance that's high enough to uh, take care of my pasty white nerdy skin, but this is very temperamental. I've got to hold it like this, can't put it, otherwise it's too noisy. And if I move at all or do anything, um, then it's going to go all over the shop. Hang on, I think I can talk. But yeah, it's pretty much all over the shop. But you can see the cardiac pulse is actually there and it's doing its thing. So it kind of works, but yeah, these I, I think this is common of uh, ECG stuff like this, but yeah, it's not terrific. And if we clean that up a bit, oh, I don't know, oh, it's all over the shop. But you can, you, you can get the cardiac waveform, but <laughs> it's not pretty. And the other thing I noticed is that there's no labeling on these. I mean, sure, it's got green, white, and red here, but it doesn't tell you how that translates to these positions here on the back. So, yeah, I mean, luckily, uh, Matthew included that diagram, which I'm uh, following. Otherwise, I just looking at this, I wouldn't know. Now, I can actually get decent results from this, but... It just varies all over the shop. I mean, all of a sudden, like, I'll get crap in there like that, and then all of a sudden I'll get that because I've uh, gone near the screen. Look. There we go. I'm picking up the switching crap from the screen. If I take my hand away. Hands further back. No, it's no good. Got to put it back here. There we go. Let me put my hand back. Yeah, put it towards there. Like... It's super duper sensitive, but if I stand right back from the bench, I can actually get my cardiac waveform, kinda. But, jeez. Stev D? Stev D? Hmm, sounds like, doesn't sound German. Um, Schwen. Um, from Berlin. Hi to all my Berlin viewers. So let's check it out. See what we've got. Sven. Sorry, I can't help but think of a, you know, Swedish massage person or something. Um, yeah. Anyway, we've got the requisite uh, DigiKey style um, 
Uh, and th there's a name for that. I forget the name of it. The corrugated uh, cardboard packaging stuff. There's like a trademark name for it. <gasps> Ooh, it's a radio sonde. Ooh, wow, cool. And, ta-da! Hi, Dave. Have fun. Tektronics. That's before they. Uh, that's the old logo. None of this new logo rubbish. What do we got? Oscilloscope evaluation guy. We got some original tech documentation. Um, and a little itty bitty, teeny weeny board. Oh, is that a, um, it looks like it's a scope eval kit. Oh, cool. So it generates waveforms and stuff like that. I love little, um, yeah, it's a genuine Tektronix evaluation board. Let's see what it does. We've got ourselves a Vaisala uh, radio sond RS80 for those playing along at home. Helsinki, Finland. Hi to all my Finnish uh, viewers. And is it? Look, it's got a uh, and uh, like the um, attachment string thing for it. What do you do? Just pull it out of the box? How? Why is that sticking out of the box? Anyway, let's have a. Oh, oh! I expected. What? What? Why is it in a, just a, where's the, I assume it was like a water radio boy or whatever, but uh, it, maybe it's just the internals. Oh, anyway, we've got some RF goodness here. This is obviously our, uh, our antenna. We've got some RF magic happening inside that can, obviously. And uh, like, I love the little grounding thing here. This is neat, but where's the... Where's the case for this? It's all, the guts have been uh, ripped out. Doll, silly me, and my uh, marine seismic background, um, I just assumed it was a uh, water, um, you know, a water radio uh, sonde, but it's not. Um, this is an airborne one designed to attach to, uh, you know, helium balloons. Hence, this is, it. I believe, this is its actual package. So this, I believe, is its actual packaging, um, and it would hook up to the battery on the balloon, or does it have an internal one? Not entirely sure, but this is its actual packaging. It's got to be as light as possible because it's lifted up into the stratosphere or where it, however high it goes, um, uh, on and under and underneath a helium balloon, and probably just, uh, I don't know how they actually uh, deploy it, it just hangs from the bottom, designed to take uh, temperature, barometric pressure and stuff like that, so the styrofoam would help keep it at a, well, you know, it, it's going to keep out the temperature for a bit, but hence why a little probe here, so is that uh, temperature or is that a barometric pressure probe? Anyway, this is the uh, transmit here, of course, that's the antenna, and they're designed to be low-cost disposable. They whack these up in the atmosphere, and then they just drift wherever and land wherever, and the planet is, um, you know, is scattered with these. I think people even play games of trying to, like, find them, hunt them down, and uh, stuff like that. I don't know how long they actually uh, transmit for, but if anyone's, uh, anyone's playing that game, oh, where does that, how does that attach? I don't know. I've lost it. Anyway, um, yeah, these, you know, you find them in the middle of fields or they could land in cities or water or, you know, anywhere. Um, and they build them down to a cost. So that is absolutely fascinating. I've always wanted to have a look at one of those. And it, like, yeah, it's pretty crude, but that's all it needs to do is transmit data and, uh, you know, transmit the data back. And, you know, they'd have a receiver somewhere. I don't know what that chip is. You want a D0863, is it? So there it is. There's our sensor down in there. So, I, I, you know, what is it? I assume it's, like, is that just temperature? Hmm, if anyone knows, um, please, please let us know. Now, it turns out this model, the RS80, dates from uh, 1981, and it's like, it was like, is, maybe was, um, the gold standard, uh, the reference uh, transfer standard, as they like to uh, claim, in radio songs like this. So, yeah, I'm sure it's come a long way since then, but um, <laughs> fascinating. Oh, I love how the tranny is soldered into the metal can like that, and they've got the penetrators uh, coming in the side here, which get the wires through. 
the outer, but look, there's someone in the transistor onto the outside. That is, that's brilliant. Ah, oh, anyway, what is an NEC C1600? Probably some sort of RFR transistor. Well, I tell you what, I cracked the can open, and this is fascinating. Look at this. What we've got here, we've got ourselves little inductor, so this penetrator comes in, goes through an inductor, then it goes through a capacitor. This is a slug tuned capacitor from the outside, basically. Well, actually, is it? No, it's, well, it's a slug tuned capacitor from here to the outer shell, I believe. That's basically what it's, uh, what it's doing there. Goes into one lead of the tranny, down in there, of course, the other lead of the transistor is the body itself. You can see that it's been, uh, the lead's been chopped off there. Then the output of that goes through here, okay, basically got a, it's effectively a transmission line, I guess. Um, and then, look, there was another piece of plastic on top of here. They're using air dielectric capacitors, basically. It's absolutely fascinating. So it loops around here like this, and then look, there's another plate there. It AC couples via those two plates to the antenna. That is insane. Wow. And then they've got this going down here, and that's going through to the other penetrator over there. That is absolutely brilliant. Now, there must be uh, physical reasons why they're implementing this sort of technique rather than just using components. Now in the blurb slash uh, product blo brochure for uh, that has a range of products, they claim that this has new uh, patented stuff for measuring small capacitances and, you know, take it, so there must be like, you know, maybe they have a patent on this sort of implementation perhaps, but I, not sure, you know, may, you can get a patent on the implementation maybe, but not air cord, um, you know, air, air dielectric capacitors and uh, stuff like that in shielded enclosures. That's, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not rocket science, but it's interesting why they must have implemented this sort of uh, thing. It must be because the environmental temperature extremes are probably too much for your regular capacitors. So they just relied on this air cord stuff. So... I don't know. If anyone's got experience in this sort of uh, field, please let us know how something like this would perform in extremely low temperatures compared to, say, you know, ser your traditional uh, ceramic NPO caps and stuff like that. Let us know, because there's, there's definitely a reason why they've implemented it like this. And, uh, you know, I sh like it's 1981. It's not recent, but still, there'd be a particular electrical reason why it was implemented like that but there's not much in it that's basically all it is is <laughs> just an rf uh, transistor uh, oscillator that uh, transmits but absolutely fascinating physical implementation i love it and what that chips there chip there is doing it's obviously like they're obviously modulated it might be a custom asic modulating the uh, temperature or whatever they're actually what this particular probe's actually uh, measuring. I believe it. It's normally temperature, barometric pressure, uh, stuff like that that they're actually measuring. So maybe two parameters um, with the one sensor, or maybe it's combined. I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but yeah. Anyway, no, it looks like no. They just got the two two wires going out to that with the shielded backing on it. Hmm, interesting. So there you go. I always wanted to have a look inside one of those things. And uh, there, I wonder how much they actually cost to build because they are designed to be disposable. They're not allowed to use any, uh, you know, any sort of, you know, bad chemical batteries or something like that. So I believe they have a special battery uh, in them, which probably works in low uh, temperatures. They're not designed to, you know, pollute the environments that they land in and stuff like that. But yeah, I'd love to like maybe compare a modern one, but... This is one from, you know, like a state-of-the-art reference standard one, you know, industry standard one from 1981. Brilliant. Hi, Dave. Have fun. <laughs> scope evaluation kit. I most certainly will. Think your scope can measure up? Let's find out. I've got an oscilloscope evaluation guide, how DPO speeds debug in, because the digital phosphor oscilloscope is the technology used in uh, the tech scopes, and this is what we've got here. 
data, clock, square wave, reset pads and ground, hook it up to a 9 volt battery, plug it into your scope and Bob's your uncle. You can get various uh, test signals that show, uh, you know, glitches and probably other uh, stuff to do with the uh, DPO troubleshooting XY displays, how DPO speeds debug in, and there you go, it's all there. It's all there. Technical reference, we've got to like that, these informative tech application notes, I'm sure you can now just download them from the uh, website, the DPO breakthrough, the digital phosphor oscilloscope technology, the power of DPX and everything else it was. Great back in the day, but of course everyone, every man and his dog's doing it uh, these days, but yeah. Let's try this out. What I'm using is a Tektronix MD-03104 mixed domain oscilloscope. It's the follow-on to the DP the original DPO uh, technology scope. So it's got the same uh, sort of thing in here. I've got it hooked up to the clock and data. And for those playing along at home, this is the data communications test setting with eye diagrams. And uh, I've set it up exactly like this with the infinite uh, persistence. And basically it's designed to show the difference between the DPO uh, and the regular DSO. So acquisition after an hour, it'll only collect 300,000 blah blah blah. It may not have sufficient to, uh, you know, to uh, detect any uh, timing violations and stuff like that. And of course, this is a classic test, and I've got it set to uh, infinite uh, persistence here. And if you clear the persistence, oh, it did capture one. You probably saw it there. So I'll zoom in on the screen and. You know, you sit here, wait for a while, it's not doing the business. So what we'll do is we'll do fast acquisition on, which is basically the DPO technology. You'll notice it switched to the record length of 1K. So it's only got a 1,000 samples. Bingo. We start capturing all the um, little timing violations, set up and hold violations on the signal. But of course, the trade-off here with that high waveform update rate, the uh, DPO technology's fast acquisition, is of course that 1,000 sample limit. So if we stop that and then we actually zoom into that, we don't have much detailed data at the, uh, there at all. So unfortunately, that is going to be the trade-off. But hey. At least it lets you see that there's something wrong there. Once you see it, aha, gotcha. And then you can investigate your design. You know you've got that set up and hold violation or whatever it is. You've got a glitch or whatever. So, yeah, it's a reasonable demo. All right, it's shootout time. The Tektronix MD-03104 versus the Keysight Infinivision MSOX 3054. So let's do clear persistence on both of them. I've got all the same uh, settings and of course you don't have to set any mode uh, you know there's no like fast acquisition mode or anything on the uh, Keysight scope. It just does the business. You don't have to specifically uh, turn on that fast acquisition like you do on the Tektronix. So if we clear the persistence on both of these bingo! I've got them hooked up and we're, well, we're starting to find them over here. We're starting to find a couple here. Sorry, I've got them both set to 95% uh, intensity up here, but uh, these ones just aren't as pronounced as here. But they're showing up. It's pretty, pretty equal, but they aren't capturing um, exactly the same thing because the trigger point is going to be different on each one. So, um, but yeah, we're getting a similar number on both. I don't know. Let's try that again. Clear persistence, boom, and they. I think they come up a bit quicker on the tech. Oh no, it depends. Once it like it's a random thing, so yeah, you know they're pretty equivalent in that respect. And if we take a lower end scope, like a four hundred dollar entry level model, but uh, this is still a pretty quick scope. Fifty thousand waveform updates per second. GW Instec GDS eleven o four B for the uh, hundred megahertz jobby, but it's got that uh, zinc. Uh, FPGA in there, it does like one meg point FFT really quick. It's very nice, but uh, yeah, where I've had it running for just since I started this uh, clip, and we haven't picked up any yet. Whereas uh, we can clear the persistence here. Here we go between the two, and yeah, we're not picking up any yet. So that's to be expected. That's the difference between one of the uh, lower end scopes and one of the uh, really higher end scopes with uh, DPO, uh, you know, type technology.
But this isn't a fair comparison because the uh, GW Instech was running at one meg points. Let's put it to a thousand points that we've got uh, on the MDO uh, 3000 here. So exactly the same record length uh, set in. And whoop, we got one. We got one. Look at this. It's coming up. So let's just clear the persistence on both of these. How do I do it? I hate changing scopes like this. It's really rather annoying. There we go. Okay, clear persistence. Boom. And it, they started coming up straight away. It's almost as good as the Whizbang uh, DPO technology, the fast acquisition in the Tektronix MDO. But that's what you get with a thousand uh, points. Of course, you, if you increase the memory, it's not updating as often. The waveform uh, per second figure is not magic. If you have the longer record length, then, eh, you know, you can't help it. But look, that works a treat. Anyway, thanks for everyone who sent in stuff to today's mailbag. I still got uh, some more stuff and I did have a camera um, that I uh, shot as well. Um, that came in the mailbag, but I think I'm going to do a separate uh, teardown of that. Well, yeah, separate video explaining um, how a digital SLR camera works. So hopefully I'll do that in a separate video. Um, I just didn't want to. It was a bit too much detail for the mailbag. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Catch you next time.